a Singular Discoveries podcast. In the previous episode of Singular Discoveries... The references to Bonnet and Charleston lead me to another document, The Trials of Major Steed Bonnet and Other Pirates. Listed on the nameplate among the other pirates is Edward Robinson. And the Commonwealth of Pirates, he who goes to the greatest lengths of wickedness, is looked upon with a kind of envy amongst them. As soon as they came aboard, they clapped their hands to their cutlasses, and I said, we are taken! So our hero assumed the cognomen of Blackbeard, from that large quantity of hair, which like a frightful meteor, covered his whole face, and frightened America more than any comet that has appeared there a long time. From Singular Discoveries, this is... Sins Died in Blood, The Lost Pirate of Blackbeard's Golden Age, Part 2. Act 4. A Lingering Death Edward Robinson had not eaten or taken water for two days. He and 16 other men were stranded on a deserted sandbank, more than three miles from the North Carolina coast. Captain Johnson describes the sandbank as a small, sandy island, about a league from the main, where there was neither bird, beast or herb for their subsistence. Robinson and the others had no provisions or materials, no shade from the sun, nor any means of getting off the sandbank. The men, Captain Johnson wrote, expected nothing less but a lingering death. Robinson and the others had been deliberately stranded or marooned. Pirates were referred to at the time as marooners, a play on mariners that referenced the common practice of leaving the crew of taken ships and the punished crew of their own ships, on deserted shores. Marooning was much more prevalent than the likely fictitious practice of making enemies walk the plank over shark-infested waters. Most pirates would not kill unless necessary, preferring to take their prizes and leave the crews marooned. When pirates set off on their sea-robbing voyages, it was said they were going marooning. Robinson was marooned by Blackbeard shortly after the Queen Anne's revenge ran aground in Topsail Inlet, What initially looked like an unusual navigational error was more likely a deliberate ploy on Blackbeard's behalf to break up the large pirate crew and secure a larger proportion of its treasure for himself and his closest companions. This is David Herriot, the adventure master, who Blackbeard forced into piracy. Thatch run his vessel aground on purpose to break up the companies and to secure what monies and effects he had got for himself and such other of them he had most value for. Blackbeard's further intention may have been to avoid detection while he sought a royal pardon. The blockade of Charleston had prompted the British government to send a new fleet of warships across the Atlantic, intending to extinguish the threat from pirates once and for all. The Queen Anne's Revenge was a large and conspicuous ship that would have been easy for the Royal Navy to identify. Blackbeard was aware that pardons were being offered to repentant pirates by Governor Charles Eden, in the nearby town of Bath. Pardoned pirates were being offered commissions to sail as privateers under licence from the British government. In effect, Blackbeard could become a state-sponsored pirate. So Blackbeard loaded up a small Spanish sloop with his treasure and a trusted crew. Steed Bonnet had already gone ahead to Bath, so Blackbeard did not need to be concerned about interference from his fellow pirate captain. A large number of men were left on board the Revenge, and Edward Robinson and 16 others, presumably those who could have disrupted Blackbeard's plan, were marooned. After two days of waiting to die, Robinson and his fellow marooners spotted a ship in the distance. On board was Steed Bonnet. He had returned from Bath with his pardon, only to find that Blackbeard had disappeared with the company's loot. Bonnet showed the marooners his pardon, or act of grace, and told them he was sailing to the Caribbean island of St Thomas to receive a privateering commission. They were welcome to go with him, he said, and in their desperate situation, they had little choice. Regaining command of the revenge, Bonnet sailed out to sea. But his true intentions were not to receive a commission. This is mariner John William Smith. I knew nothing but that we were going to St Thomas, but after we were out, they hoisted the bloody flag. Bonnet's first impulse was to find Blackbeard and claim revenge for his treachery. It seems unlikely that Robinson or any of the other marooners would have argued, having been left by Blackbeard to die. 
Bonnet didn't find Blackbeard, but he did come across several merchant ships. Claiming to need provisions, he took pork and bread from a small pink and then rum and molasses from a 60-ton sloop. The Revenge then chased down two ships from Glasgow and took tobacco and other provisions. A merchant ship from Bristol, the Fortune, was also taken, and its captain, Thomas Reed, was taken prisoner. Then, at Delaware Bay in August 1718, Bonnet, Robinson and the other pirates encountered the sloop, the Francis. And that's where this story began. Steed Bonnet might not be as well known as Blackbeard, but he is one of the most interesting pirates profiled in Captain Johnson's general history. A wealthy and well-educated young man from an aristocratic family in Barbados, Bonnet left his comfortable life and his wife and children to become a pirate. This is Captain Johnson. The Major was a gentleman of good reputation in the island of Barbados, was master of a plentiful fortune and had the advantage of a liberal education. He had the least temptation of any man to follow such a course of life from the condition of his circumstances. It was very surprising to everyone to hear of the Major's enterprise in the island where he lived, as he was generally esteemed and honoured, before he broke out into open acts of piracy. Major Bonnet was not a military man. The government of Barbados bestowed military rankings on land-owning aristocrats, and Bonnet had inherited many acres of plantations from his father and via his marriage. Bonnet was not a seafaring man either, being described by Captain Johnson as ill-qualified for the business, as not understanding maritime affairs. He took the unusual step of leaving his plantation to go pirating due to, according to Johnson, a disorder of the mind caused by an unhappy marriage. Bonnet used his own funds to buy a sloop, fit it out with ten guns and crew it with seventy men. Naming his ship the Revenge, he sailed in the spring of 1717 for the coast of America. Initially, it seems, Bonnet's entry to piracy was very successful. The Revenge plundered the coastal waters from Virginia to New York, stealing money, ammunition and other bounties from ships using the busy trade routes. But Bonnet's lack of seafaring knowledge saw him increasingly sidelined by his more experienced crew. The Major was no sailor, as said before, and therefore had been obliged to yield to many things that were imposed on him during their undertaking. After taking the Francis, the Revenge sailed to Cape Fear, where the crew set about careening and refitting the sloop. Careening involved beaching the ship at high tide in order to repair its hull. It was a dangerous and laborious activity that required the pirates to remain in situ for some time. Eventually, news of the sloop's location reached a still fearful Charleston. To prevent another assault, Governor Robert Johnson authorised a commission against the pirates, sending Colonel William Rett with two armed sloops, the Henry and the Sea Nymph. Rett arrived at Cape Fear on the 26th of September 1718 and soon spotted the Revenge, which had been refitted and was anchored alongside Bonnet's two prizes, the Fortune and the Francis. On spotting King George's colours, the pirates prepared to attack, Bonnet emptied the prizes and moved all of his men to the Revenge. Bonnet also wrote a letter, intended for Governor Johnson. The letter was to this effect, that if the sloops which then appeared were sent out against him by the said Governor and he should get clear off, that he would burn and destroy all ships or vessels going in or coming out of South Carolina. At first light, the Revenge sailed towards Colonel Rett's sloops, designing only a running fight but the Henry and the Sea Nymph cut off the escape route and began, quote, warmly engaging the pirates with two sets of eight guns. The pirates responded via Edward Robinson's guns, which were repeatedly fired and reloaded, smashing round shots into Rett's vessels, splintering their hulls and injuring their crews. Rett's intention was to get close enough to board the Revenge, but as the pirate ship edged away towards shore, it ran aground. The Henry, as it moved within pistol shot range, also ran aground. A little further behind and out of gunshot range, the Sea Nymph also became stranded on the shallow seabed. All three ships were stuck, and what followed was an awkward six hour fight during which Rhett's Henry and Bonnet's revenge exchanged brisk gunfire and insults. 
The pirates held a slight advantage in that their ship was positioned at an angle that provided them with some cover, enabling them to pop flintlock and musket shots over the ship's bow and shelter from retaliatory fire. The pirates beckoned with their hats in derision to the colonel's men to come on board, which they answered with cheerful huzzas and told them it would soon be their turn. Not all of the pirates wanted to participate in the battle, but, according to one, George Duncan, Major Bonnet declared, if anyone refused to fight, he would blow their brains out. As the tide changed, Rhett's Henry was the first sloop to refloat. Its rigging had been damaged in the battle, but it was able to manoeuvre around the revenge and give the finishing stroke. The pirates raised a flag of truce and surrendered. The battle was over. Seven pirates had been killed, and two more had been mortally wounded. Twelve of Rhett's men were dead, and eighteen were wounded. Rhett placed Bonnet, Robinson and the remaining pirates in irons, took the revenge and recovered the fortune and the Francis. After refitting and taking fresh water, Rhett sailed back to Charleston, arriving with his prisoners on the 3rd of October 1718, to the great joy of the whole province of Carolina. Act 5. Cry for vengeance. So I followed in the footsteps of Edward Robinson, and I travelled 4,000 miles across the Atlantic, from Newcastle to Charleston. I arrived on a glorious late spring day, the sunlight illuminating multicoloured rows of antebellum houses and throwing the spidery shadows of palmetto trees onto the ground. Horse-drawn carriages loaded with tourists clip-clopped through the streets, their guides telling tales of this pretty city's lively history. What I quickly learn is that very little of the Charleston from Edward Robinson's time survives today. The oldest building in the city is probably the Pink House, a small bubblegum hued stone residence that stands on the cobbled Chalmers Street in the French Quarter. It's thought to have been built in 1712 and, like those old quayside houses in Newcastle, it once housed a pub and a brothel. In 1718, when Edward Robinson arrived in chains, Charleston, then Charlestown, was a small but prosperous walled port butted between the Ashley and Cooper rivers, the latter of which flows into the Atlantic. As the southernmost settlement of the British colony, Charleston was an important trading post. Maps from the time show that Charleston covered an area equivalent to around eight city blocks and was surrounded by a curtain wall with six projecting bastions and a drawbridge gate. The fortifications were essential because the isolated outpost was vulnerable to attack. For decades, Charleston had fought off land raids from Native Americans and sea raids from the French and Spanish. Now they had to contend with pirates. Among Charleston's good buildings were houses and churches and inns, but no prison. Instead, Steed Bonnet was held at the residence of Town Marshal Nathaniel Partridge. Edward Robinson and the rest of the pirates were held outside the town walls at the Watch House, across a creek at White Point, so-called for the white oyster shells that washed up on its shore. After a few days, Adventure Master David Herriot and Revenge Boatswain Ignatius Pell, who had agreed to testify against the pirates, were removed to the Marshal's house with Bonnet. On the 24th of October 1718, after three weeks in captivity, Bonnet and Herriot escaped. Pell refused to go with them. Bonnet and Herriot obtained a canoe and headed north, but bad weather meant they only got as far as Sullivan's Island, across the bay from Charleston Harbour. When news of the escape reached Governor Johnson, he sent Colonel Rhett after them, offering a reward of £700 for Bonnet's return. Marshal Partridge was relieved of his duties. Despite Bonnet's absence, the piracy trial began on the 28th of October, presided over by Nicholas Trott, judge of the Vice Admiralty and Chief Justice of South Carolina. Trott, the brother-in-law of Colonel Rhett, was a fascinating character, notorious for the political and religious proclamations that peppered his judgments. The trial began with a lengthy speech, coloured with Latin and biblical references that seemed to condemn the prisoners before they took the stand. Piracy is a robbery committed upon the sea, and a pirate is a sea thief. As to the heinousness or wickedness of the offence, it needs no aggravation, it being evident to the reason of all men. The inhabitants of this province have of late, to their great cost and damages, 
felt the evil of piracy. Trot also invoked the memory of Rhett's men who were killed in the battle at Cape Fear. The blood of those murdered persons will cry for vengeance against the offenders. The pirates were tried in groups. Edward Robinson and his group were indicted with, quote, feloniously and piratically taking the sloops, the Francis and the Fortune. It was also pointed out that they were all old offenders who had taken at least 28 vessels in the company of Blackbeard and Bonnet. All in Robinson's group pleaded not guilty. Ignatius Pell gave evidence against his former crewmates, as did Captain Reed of the Francis and Captain Manwaring and James Killing of the Fortune. Several of the pirates claimed they had joined with Bonnet out of desperation after being marooned by Blackbeard and believed that Bonnet was sailing to receive a pardon. Among them was Edward Robinson, and for the first time we have a record of Robinson's actual words. This is what he told the court. When Captain Thatch left us, it was on a maroon island, and Major Bonnet came and told me he was going to St Thomas's, and we might go with him. The pirates were given no legal counsel, but were invited to make their own cases. When given the opportunity to question the evidence of Ignatius Pell, Robinson said, Boatswain, do you not remember, when we left Topsail Inlet? It was with a design to go to St Thomas's. I do believe you might think we were going to St Thomas's, replied Pell. But the first vessel we see we consented to take, and you had your share as well as the rest. During the evidence of Captain Reed, Robinson claimed he had never set foot on the Francis. Captain Reed, when did you see me aboard your sloop? I cannot say I saw you on board, replied Reed, but you were with them when they shared. Judge Trott then interjected, addressing Robinson. If you was not on board the sloop, you was one of the crew. And as I told you before, it's not they only are pirates that go on board a vessel, but they that stand ready to assist are as much pirates as the other, and are as much concerned in the fact. Despite his protests, the court had decided that Edward Robinson was a pirate. As the trial approached its end, on the 1st of November 1718, Judge Trott addressed the 12-man jury. Gentlemen of the jury, the prisoners at the bar stand indicted for felony and piracy. All the evidences fully prove the fact upon them that they were all equally guilty and all shared in the goods and plunder. They all pretend they were under force and constraint, but it is a suggestion of their own, without the least proof. But there is full proof of their consenting. I shall leave them to your consideration. But the case is so clear that I believe you will not be long before you return with your verdict. After deliberating for a short while, the jury returned. One by one, the defendants were ordered to raise their hands as Judge Trott addressed the foreman of the jury. How say you? Is he guilty of the piracy whereof he now stands indicted, or not guilty? For each defendant, the foreman and Mr. Timothy Bellamy replied, Guilty. The sentence was passed on the 5th of November. Judge Trott addressed the prisoners with another lengthy speech. You cannot but acknowledge that you have, all of you, had a fair and indifferent trial. No one can think but that you were, all of you, justly found guilty. As to the crime that you are convicted of, which is piracy, the evil and wickedness of it is evident to the reason of all men. Pirates are called enemies to mankind, with whom no faith or oath ought to be kept, and they are termed in our law brutes and birds of prey. Most sad and deplorable is the condition you have brought yourselves to, to be adjudged by the laws of the country unworthy any longer to live and to tread the earth or breathe this air, and that no further good or benefit can be expected from you but by the example of your deaths, and to stand like marks or fatal rocks and sands to warn others from the same shipwreck and ruin for the future. You caused your terror to be on all that haunt the sea, your sins were dyed in blood. You shall go from here to the place whence you came, and from thence to the place of execution, where you shall be severally hanged by the neck till you are severally dead, and the God of infinite mercy be merciful to every one of your souls. On Saturday the 8th of November 1718, Edward Robinson and 28 others were taken from the watch house onto the White Point. Nooses were placed around their necks, and in front of a crowd of townsfolk, they were strung from a gallows and hanged. It was a brutal and protracted means of execution. The more efficient long-drop method of hanging, which delivered a swift broken neck, 
had yet to be invented. Instead, Robinson and the other pirates twisted and struggled on their ropes, slowly and painfully dying of strangulation over a period of 10 or 20 minutes. It was one of the largest mass hangings in history. Two days later, on the 10th of November, Steed Bonnet was brought to the same place. He had been recaptured by Colonel Rett and returned to Charleston to face justice. The other escapee, David Herriot, had been shot dead during the capture. Herriot, who had been forced into piracy following the taking of his adventure, had left behind a sworn deposition detailing the pirate's crimes. Bonnet stood trial and was found guilty, with Judge Trott condemning the pirate captain to the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Stripped of his gentleman's finery and with his powdered wig removed from his bald head, Bonnet clutched a small bunch of flowers in his hands as he was hanged from the gallows until dead. Today, White Point Garden is a pretty harbourside park filled with oak trees and military monuments. At the northeast corner of the park stands a large granite marker engraved as a memorial of sorts to the pirates. The memorial reads, Near this spot in the autumn of 1718, Steed Bonnet, notorious gentleman pirate, and 29 of his men, captured by Colonel William Rett, met their just deserts after a trial and charge famous in American history by Chief Justice Nicholas Trott. The marker was erected in 1941 by the Charleston Historical Commission, but the original pirate marker was a wooden sign that stood in a street a couple of blocks to the north. That's because, after being left to hang at White Point for several days, the pirates' bodies were cut down and buried at low tide near the mouth of the old creek. The creek ran along what is now Water Street, a quiet and typically pristine Charleston thoroughfare. Number 14 Water Street, the Young Keenan House, is a large colonial home with a beautiful two-storey front porch. It was built in 1769, some 50 years after the hangings. The original wooden pirate marker stood at the old low tide mark right outside the house. The marker is gone now and there's nothing left to suggest it was ever here. But this spot, outside the young Keenan house, represents the end of a long journey and the last resting place of Edward Robinson. There are stories in Charleston that Water Street is haunted by apparitions of the executed pirates. That if you look out to the Cooper River under a full moon, you can see the faces of the dead pirates below the waterline. But Edward Robinson is not a ghost. He lived a remarkable life during a fascinating chapter of history and played a key role in the stories of Blackbeard, Steed Bonnet and the golden age of piracy. There are many outstanding questions. Was Robinson a merchant or murderer? Was his Concord the ship that became the Queen Anne's revenge? Recent explorations of that ship's wreck have recovered artefacts that suggest it was of British origin and have recovered some of the cannons that would have been the responsibility of gunner Edward Robinson. It's possible we will never know for sure how or why he became a pirate, how fully he embraced the often stark realities of pirate life, and whether or not he deserved his pitiless fate. The answers are buried with him, in the old creek under Water Street, 4,000 miles from his home. In the next season of Singular Discoveries, more true stories from the forgotten corners of history. To make sure you don't miss the next season, just follow Singular Discoveries on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to listen to an exclusive bonus episode and access the entire first season, ad-free, just go to singulardiscoveries.com. Sins Died in Blood was written and produced by Paul Brown, based on his e-book of the same name. You can find more of his writing at stuffbypaulbrown.com. Thanks again for listening and for supporting Singular Discoveries. Singulardiscoveries.com. <laughs>